the last two years uh, globally, despite all the uh, economic, social, political, uh, and a global pandemic, one of the industries in Africa is booming, and that is fintech. Between 2020 and 2021, the number of tech startups in Africa tripled to around 5,200, and just under half of these are fintech. So our guests today have been in the business of fintech for over a decade in the region and have navigated all these challenges of introducing a new way of life, um, digital money in the region, where infrastructure and traditional banking has been non-existent in, every, in many places, not reaching the mass population. However, thanks to their boldness in going where no one has dared to go before, Africa's fintech today and as seen as in the rest of the world, has leapfrogged the rest of the world. Today, we will explore from the captains of the industries how these fintech propositions have helped to deliver compelling solutions for customers, how they have driven engagement, and how they've disrupted the market and the fintech eruption that is now the hotbed for investments in the region. Now, recognizing the need to continue to innovate, our guests today will share their visions and their strategies that will continue to create the differentiation in the hugely dynamic fintech market. Our first guest this morning is the Managing Director and the Acting Chief Financial Services Officer at Safaricom PLC. He is responsible for managing and growing m -Pesa in seven markets in Africa with over 50 million active customers and over 3.7 million SMEs and MSMEs. Please welcome to the stage, Sitoyo Lopokoit. I think for me, uh, in the previous panel, I gave an example of um, how, you know, I, I, I didn't cover my credit card uh, to Rwanda because uh, of rushing from the office to, to the airport. And uh, I've been using uh, M-Pesa, which is fully integrated with MTN. And um, it's been fantastic the interacting with the taxi guy. And I've paid two ta three taxi guys uh, via M-Pesa. And I, and I can see the, all their three names. And when I mention all their names, and they go, how did you know that? And I say, yeah, we integrated with MTN uh, uh, for, for mobile money and then Sooner or later, there were three or four taxi guys around me, you know, everyone wanting to see how this technology works. So it just showcases a sm small example. But today I wanted to, you know, I'll talk a lot more about uh, the business side of M-Pesa, uh, where we empower businesses and SMEs. And the reason why, uh, if I give an example, there's a lady called Pauline in Kenya. Uh, and her story was interesting. She used to have a restaurant during COVID. And uh, because of uh, restaurants being shut down and um, during that particular time, she had to let her go of her staff. And uh, what happened was uh, she started selling groceries at the boot of her car. And this became one of the most iconic things that happened in Kenya during the pandemic. People who had lost their jobs or were not able to um, started, you know, you find a somebody who had a Mercedes Benz is sitting by the roadside with a boot open selling groceries and trying to make a living. And that's the same thing what Pauline did. And she started leveraging on WhatsApp uh, for, to get her clients, M-Pesa for payments, and eventually she bought a motorcycle for deliveries. Today, she's now fully into delivery and she's re-employed all her staff and has actually hired more than 10 people on top of that and she's still doing it uh, remotely. And these are just stories about how what we're trying to do in the continent becomes sort of uh, very key. But I think uh, with regard to, uh, it's not coming up in the picture quite well, but I think you'll see two, uh, two aspects of, MP of what we do as a group uh, between Vodacom and uh, M-Pesa. And the reason why you'll be seeing is, m -Pesa is 15 years old, so it's been, it started when, the, you know, the word fintech had not been coined. I mentioned it started before the iOS uh, and so on. And 
um, voter page started on the other end, which is from a smartphone perspective and then working back down. So you'll see the synergies between myself and Mariam and, uh, on how we are leveraging this to from um, I'm evolving from a technology standpoint, hash is on the upper um, part of how the tech and then how we are sort of synergizing in it. Um, so I think for us it's two things. We are a two-sided network and you'll be seeing us saying that in all our presentation as a group uh, about consumers and merchants, uh, the business side. For consumers, it's about lifestyle. For merchants, it's about empowerment of businesses. And today my presentation will be a lot about the enterprise side. Why? Because I think that's the most exciting part of it. Uh, World Bank uh, put some statistics that nine out of 10 people employed in Africa in, uh, are employed from the SME side of it. 40% of the GDP of the African continent, most of the countries in the African continent are uh, driven by SMEs. And that's why you, you'll see us having a really big focus on uh, SMEs. So on the consumer side, as I said, it's about building a super app, leveraging on, you know, uh, on, on the new technologies, but also we have a SIM toolkit and the USSD channel uh, to provide various financial services. So from the consumer side, it's 52 million customers. Uh, we do 61 million transactions a day. Um, you know, it's a lot of guys Google these things and uh, they said it beats what PayPal, uh, Western Union and MoneyGram combined. It just shows the, the impact of what we are doing in, in this continent. And Ngozi of uh, MasterCard put a transaction, uh, a statistic that $700 billion uh, uh, is in digital payments, and 70% is in Africa, yeah? And out of that 700, 324 billion is in M-Pesa. So it showcases the impact of what we're trying to do uh, uh, in the continent. And I think, you know, sometimes we look at a lot of these valuation of these companies, and it's great to see that, but I think what is happening in the African continent is, is, is truly remarkable, and we'll be seeing a lot uh, of it, and it's great to see you know, large amounts, I think $2.7 billion in venture capital has gone in, I think, in the last six months or so uh, in, 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 in Africa. So it's, it's great to see the growth of that. Of course, technology is important. And I think Miriam will be talking a lot about that aspect and, you know, uh, what opportunities it does create for e-commerce and so on and so forth. But for us, I think the issues that I mentioned before on partnerships and the ecosystem. So. Uh, in the last presentation, I said I don't like the word fintech. Uh, no, I don't like it, but I think it, it narrows the scope of what we're trying to do in the continent because it's about a digital ecosystem that covers education, healthcare, insurance, wealth management, you know, payments, lending, and, and so on. So when it covers, an, when, you, when we use the word ecosystem, it's just to showcase uh, that it's, it's about inclusivity of various products and services that are sitting on it. I think with regard to financial inclusion, this story is well written uh, with regard to uh, M-Pesa, the impact on driving financial inclusion from 23% to well over 84%. And that's across most of our markets. But I think what is now becoming key is financial health. And that has actually deteriorated in the continent um, in terms of savings, wealth management, insurance, and you'll be seeing what as a group we're doing later on, I think in Miriam's presentation, but those are the opportunities and the new emerging opportunities that are coming out uh, in it. And then also how do we ensure this inclusivity with regards to uh, um, uh, the SMEs and micro SMEs. So with regard to uh, the, what's on my right side, oh, yeah, it's on your right side, uh, with regard to businesses, I just wanted to talk about what problem are we trying to solve for SMEs and micro SMEs? And I think this is very important. Innovation should not just be for innovation. There's a lot of good tech, there's lots of good ideas, but it, it is what are we trying to solve? And um, if you're in Europe today and you use a card uh, and you tap and pay, and it's fantastic, it works, but that money doesn't go to the merchant. It goes to the acquiring bank, and the acquiring bank will settle T plus one, T plus two, uh, uh, for it. It's fantastic how it works uh, in Europe and more advanced, but 
when it comes to Af in Africa, that money must happen real time. So how do you ensure that that money that is paid for is used by the SME that day and immediately? Because he's paying for his supplier uh, the same day. He's paying for his daily business permit the same, the same day. So he's doing a lot of business payments that are happening on a daily basis. So his value chain and flow of money is completely different from, let's say, a major hotel or a, or a, or a business uh, in, in Europe that's using card transactions. So how do we ensure that it's not just a collection part that is solved, and that's why I said uh, money is, is good, cash is good, uh, and digital payments is good. But I think how you digitize the payments that an SME does, I think that's a tr transformative part of it. And we focused on payments and on the own of the business. So I can be here in Kigali, and I'm running 10 restaurants in Nairobi, and I can see all my inflows. I can make payments. Uh, I can pay uh, the suppliers. I can pay salaries. I can pay the tax authorities all fr from my phone. And that has enabled businesses to prosper. And today, over 60% of what you see on the M-Pesa side of it is happening uh, in, the, in, in, in the enterprise space. And this part, uh, when we launched the M-Pesa Business Super, today uh, over 200,000 merchants are using the app and it has an activity rate of 89%. That means it's actually used as much as WhatsApp. Just imagine a business app being used as much as WhatsApp. So it means we are getting to a point where businesses are embracing what technology can do with regard to empowering them. So this is the empowerment side of it. So we started with collection, then payments, and then now things that will come in, working capital, insurance, leveraging on the super app to provide relevant products and services for this side. This is the first time SMEs are actually being digitized. And for government, it's great because they have to see visibility. So I think in Kenya, the official registration registered SMEs are two, two point something million. Uh, on M-Pesa, we can see seven million. It takes a big difference on how visibility of financial transactions are able uh, to showcase the government about what this means uh, uh, and how they can provide policies and, and, uh, and, and, and regulations that enable SMEs uh, in it. So that's why I was quite keen to just showcase what exactly we are doing with regards to business payments. I think the story of consumers is quite well uh, noticed. But I think from the consumer standpoint, just wanted to showcase how we make it a lifestyle app and that's how we uh, we've leveraged and uh, thanks to Mariam and team, you know, helping us understand what, uh, how to build a super app and the capabilities around it. And I'll just showcase what we're doing uh, on M-Pesa, leveraging on the smartphone. Um, uh, uh. The future of money is simple, like unlocking possibilities with a smile and having the world in the palm of your hand. It's the ability to touch many lives at the same time and turn your dreams into reality. It's forgetting and still remembering. Simple is having everything that you love in one place. From the ticket to your next meal, to your ticket to the next holiday. It's an easy way to ask for a boost when you're low. and keeping track of everything on the go. The future of money is simple, and it's here. Download the new M-Pesa app today. So just to give you a bit of a flavor and uh, on what the super app capabilities are, and I've been impressed more with the government than the FinTech community uh, in Kenya. The government actually has rolled out more mini apps uh, than the fintech community. So for uh, uh, the National Social Security Fund, National the Insurance Fund, uh, there are quite a few government uh, services that have actually embedded uh, in it, the e-citizen platform in Kenya uh, and so on in Tanzania, we're also seeing that. So we, we're actually seeing government becoming more agile than, uh, uh, than the fintech uh, community. And I think some of the stuff that uh, we're trying to do uh, is also leverage on our scale is to build standardized ones, whether it's on flights, you know, uh, Uber and so on and so forth that we are trying to, to leverage on um, uh, with regards to uh, the, the, the super app. I think the last thing just wanted to 
to highlight for myself is some of the trends that we're seeing. Uh, I spoke about digital platforms. Uh, you know, in Kenya, Tanzania, there are more than 100 digital lenders, and each of those digital lenders has built a platform. How much money have we spent in building the lending platforms? Yet, these platforms are actually available. I know if you talk to Mariam, they can give you a, lending, a beautiful lending platform, a software as a service, but we get consumed as fintechs in building our own. We get a great number of developers, rather than focusing on what are we trying to solve, and then how do we create skill. Yeah? And that's what big tech has beaten us. I've not seen a WhatsApp uh, server in Rwanda. I haven't seen it in Nairobi. But when I, I want to build something in Rwanda, I have to build a, put it in primary data center here, secondary data center here, and so on and so forth. I'm just giving examples, but what it does is it makes it so expensive for us to roll our products in Africa, but for big tech, they come and roll it out in the continent. So I think these are some of the things we need to engage with regulators and see how, because platforms then enable um, uh, us to, to do many things. Why should Flutterwave have got created a, a fantastic B2B platform? Why not? Why shouldn't I use it? Why should I build my own, let's say, for example, a B2B platform? I think sustainability is really important um, uh, and ensuring inclusivity as well as we build a lot of good tech. So please remember in, in the continent, there are a lot of visually impaired people. In Kenya, it's 6 million visually impaired people. So it's more than 12% of the population of the country cannot use some of your digital services. So we need to start thinking about that. The other bit is we should stop building products and services for the people in this room. Yeah, Everything is about somebody who's 35 and above, yet 23% of the African population is between 10 and 18. Yeah? More than 50% of the population is below 25 in Africa. Those guys are tech savvy. You know, give a 10 year old a phone and they will understand how more about those functionalities than us. You know, they're in, if you look at e-commerce, if you're looking at all the digital services, you're looking at Spotify, you're looking at all, they're not, the, 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 the no novelty of sending money home is gone. So I think it's about how do we build products and services for the next generation. Uh, in it, I've spoken about the e uh, digital ecosystem as well as partnerships and then seeing the regulator as, you know, in all our presentations, I see we, see we put cybersecurity and I mentioned cybersecurity and regulators as the biggest threats. But I think regulator needs to be put as the biggest opportunity. Uh, in us, and if you work with the regulator that way, uh, rather than saying the regulators are slowing down fintech, fintech is evolving faster. I mean, there are you and us. There's no difference. There's no, there's, there's, I could be in the regulator tomorrow. Am I slow? I don't know. But we have to see the regulator as a person who is, is just like us. I mean, they, tech, they understand the technology, but they they are protecting the system from a systemic risk. Uh, but I think we just need to work closer with them. And, and, and engage and see them as an opportunity rather than a blocker. So with those few remarks, I'll pause there uh, and hand back to Thank you. Thank you so much for those uh, remarks in that presentation. It sets the scene for the next uh, presenter. Um, our next guest is uh, the Vodacom Group uh, Chief Executive Officer from the Vodacom Financial and Digital Services. She has a portfolio that's focusing on disruptive financial services, and specifically in the areas of microinsurance, payments, microloans, financial inclusion for small and medium enterprises, covering a customer base of over 14 million and generating over a billion rand of profit for the Vodacom Group. Please welcome to the stage, Mariam Kasim. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, and it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, so you've just heard from uh, Setoyo, um, and he's spoken about one of the most um, celebrated fintech success stories on the African continent. Um, as you heard from Setoyo, we celebrated the 15th birthday of M-Pesa this year with millions of customers later, we still continue to evolve and innovate every single day. So what does the future of financial services look like? Uh, why is it important for telcos to be thinking about financial services? 
Um, and what does it mean for the African continent? Um, I think this video really depicts how important fintech is for the African continent. The world as we know it has changed irrevocably. From the metaverse to life on Mars, we're hurtling at pace towards a digital future where everything we need is right at our fingertips, just a phone swipe or a mouse click away. It's exciting, yes, but it also excludes. It excludes her and her and him and her too. It excludes all of them. It excludes 17% of Africa's rural poor who have no mobile coverage. Too many people are simply left behind. At Vodacom Financial Services, we know that FinTech has the power to reshape our world so that there's a future for everyone. With FinTech, we believe we can solve real world problems like driving social and financial inclusion for the most vulnerable among us, helping people grow their financial stability over time, enabling those with no or poor credit to qualify for loans through their phones by doing a deep data dig to determine their credit worthiness. This new tech is turning phones into point of sale systems and helping entrepreneurs scale up and access e-commerce platforms. It's paving the way for cross-border trade and transfers. FinTech is redefining the very nature of money. At Vodacom Financial Services, we're driving FinTech to help us reach our purpose. Creating a progressive digital payments ecosystem that benefits all. Creating a world where access to affordable financial and digital services is a right, not a privilege. Because we know that only FinTech has the power to reach the furthest mile, that most faraway village, so that no one is left behind. The future of FinTech is Vodapay. Okay, impactful, right? So, why financial services in a telco? Um, this question has often been asked, um, and in my opinion, the answer is really simple. There are a few key strategic levers that a telco has within its system of advantage that makes the success of fintech products relatively easy when compared to traditional financial services companies. The first asset, I believe, is the fact that telcos have a trusted brand, which is not always the case with traditional financial services players. The Vodacom Group currently operates in nine countries across the African continent and is market leader in every country that we operate in. So this has contributed to immense love and trust for the brand. The second asset is our access to customers. Believe it or not, the Vodacom Group has access to just over 500 million people on the African continent, just through the countries that we serve. And this results in an extremely low cost of customer acquisition when compared to traditional financial services companies who typically spend between 25 to 30% of their revenue on acquiring a customer and building a brand. The third asset is access to phenomenal distribution uh, that telcos have. The Vodacom Group have millions of points of distribution for the core telco products that we sell in every one of our markets, both physical and digital, and this can be leveraged for our financial services products. And the final asset, which I really believe is the biggest one of the future, is the access to data. As we've heard in many presentations before, data is the new oil, and just as we've had Wars fought over oil in the past, there will be wars fought over data or in customer data in the future. Telcos have a massive advantage in this regard as the data they have on customers is completely unparalleled when compared to any other industry. At Vodacom right now, we currently know 5,000 things about each of our customers. And this includes everything from the time they wake up in the morning to the time they go to bed at night, the number of uninterrupted hours of sleep someone is getting, um, the websites that they frequent, the online purchases that they do, the number of base stations that they travel through, etc., etc. 
So we all know that having access to data is just a small part of the data solve. Um, the real benefit, we believe, comes through understanding the data and ensuring that we're able to simulate the data and draw correlations between the various data points that we have and the products that we're creating so that we're always using the customer data to position the best offer to them at any point in time. So examples of this include, in our insurance business, we've been able to draw a positive correlation between the number of base stations that a customer travels through and their propensity to claim on their mobile phone um, through their mobile insurance product. Or a correlation between the time that you rise every morning and your credit profile, <laughs> which allows us to sell 48% of all prepaid airtime right now through a small loan first. This allows us to give unsecured loans to customers, which start from as little as $50 cents, just using the data that we have. This not only increases customer ARPU, but it decreases customer churn, increases customer active days for our telco customers. And we've also used this um, same algorithm or capability to launch various buy now, pay later type products for our customers. And this is already proving to be successful in the e-commerce strategy that we've just launched. So we really believe that the winners in any industry going forward are going to be those organizations that best understand the needs of the customer and customer data becomes a really important element of, um, of success in this. Okay, so how have our products evolved thus far? This slide really just shows the evolution of our fintech offering over the last few years. Um, I personally joined the Vodacom Group just over six years ago with a clear mandate to conceptualize and execute on the group's fintech strategy for the future having inherited a rather small loss-making business at the time with very few employees, we've now managed to turn the business extremely profitable with just the South African FinTech business contributes close to 10% of the telco profit in just a few years. Having started off with a simple mobile phone insurance product, we've now evolved into categories of not just insurance, but categories of payments, lending, savings and investment, and finally, our recently launched VodaPay Super App. Having come from the financial services industry, I always knew that the mobile network operators or the telcos were merely just sleeping giants in the space of financial services, and hence the excitement that has led to this success. Today, Vodacom Financial Services is a fully suited financial services player focusing on solutions for both consumers and small businesses and continues to produce double-digit growth within the group. Um, in the lending space, as an example, the Vodalend model has disrupted the um, customer journey for small businesses applying for loans. It's a fully digital channel and we provide loans up to a maximum of 80,000 US dollars for small businesses. And we've helped many small businesses which needed funding, especially through the pandemic. Um, whilst many other providers paused their books to these small businesses, we continued. Another innovation is the launch of our merchant cash advance product. So this product is extremely disruptive. It's offered to our merchants who already have a voter pay point of sale device. And this allows the merchant to be automatically credit scored um, and the repayments get taken off as a small percentage of the payments that are processed through the POS device by customers. So this method of collection really assists um, with decreasing the credit risk for the merchant because the merchant doesn't have to save for a repayment at the end of the month and really reduces the cost of funding for the merchant. Uh, when it comes to the payments environment, we've assisted with the evolution of cash to digital payments in a very cost-effective manner. We'd like to ensure that businesses are fully equipped to take payments seamlessly and effortlessly from their customers. Um, one point of sales innovation mobile solution allows, ma allows um, our enterprises or small businesses to manage their inventory and receive payments wherever they are. And then of course, the latest addition to our family, the Vodapay Super App, which has just turned 
one year old. Um, and this really just allows customers who do not have credit cards or bank accounts to transact um, as if they were included in, in the financial services ecosystem. So Vodapay is a holistic financial and lifestyle ecosystem that provides convenience to our customers and our merchants and allows for in-store payments, um, online payments, web payments, in-app payments, etc. Okay, so, oops, sorry, I think. Yeah, okay. So, how do we take our products to our customers? Um, we've ensured that wherever possible, we integrate our FinTech offerings into the customer's telco journey, both for consumers and small business owners. This is, of course, where it makes sense to do that. For other standalone products, we have built various separate distribution channels, which are always focused on digital first and mobile first in everything that we do. As mentioned previously, we spend a significant amount of time on segmenting our customers. And our big data allows us to, in many instances, segment our customers to the segment of one, which is completely unheard of. Finally, our international expansion um, is moving very quickly as we share best practice between all our markets and working very closely with Citoyo and our M-Pesa markets, um, but also offer consulting services to telcos who operate in non-compete markets to the Vodacom and Vodafone group and wish to leverage the expertise that we've built over the last 15 years and the success that we've achieved as, um, as a result. So, regarding purpose, um, we firmly believe that no business will be successful unless it has a defined purpose. Our purpose is to ensure that access to financial services is a right and definitely not a privilege. And this keeps us centered, it keeps us focused, and it just keeps us grounded in everything that we do. So every new product idea that we create starts with the customer in the center and a problem-solving mindset. What's the customer's issue that we're trying to solve? Um, and how do we use the talent of our diverse, very smart team members and professionals that we employ to really ensure that we're disrupting the current ecosystem and coming up with the best solution for our customers. Okay, so our business model is extremely simple. We cater for both the consumer as well as small business merchants in all our product categories. These two worlds are then brought together by our recently launched Vodapay Super App, uh, which we launched with Alipay one, one year ago. So what is Vodapay? Vodapay is the one app for anything and everything. It's a financial services marketplace, it's an entertainment and content hub, it's a digital mall, um, a really, uh, it's a, it's a multi-channel payments gateway and a behavior-driven app. So all of this is really in one single application. What I really wanted to show with this video is what does the future of a Vodapay Super app look like, where we headed, um, and of course this will also become the future of what we're launching across all our mobile money um, propositions on the African continent.
yellow gogo. I like them. Add it to my cart. Okay, the shoes have been added to your cart. Cool. So, um, in summary, guys, um, I really hope that this video has left you all sufficiently excited about the opportunities that lie ahead for the financial services and fintech industry. Um, thank you to all of you for listening. For those of you who came back, thank you for coming back. And I think thank you for thank you to MWC, GMCA, uh, for the platform for sharing. I just think, you know, the more of these we have, um, the better it becomes. And the more we're able to advance partnerships, the more we're able to really work together to create real financial inclusion on the continent, uh, which is, I think, what we're all here to do. So... Uh, to those of you who I've networked with before, I look forward to working together and to the rest of you, hope to network after this and look for new opportunities to partner. Thanks so much. My name is Lucy Shutin Babazi, as they said. I lead advocacy and partnerships from a continental level for this alliance that has been here for 10 years now. So my, if I can live here having you as a partner and as an advocate, <laughs> that means that I can quickly work myself out of this job and join Sitoyo and Mariam uh, in, in back, getting back to the kitchen to create solutions that really uh, transform lives. So the Better Than Cash Alliance is, a, is, a, uh, is an alliance of uh, 80 members. It includes governments, 13 of which are in, the, uh, are in Africa, companies such as GAP, H&M, Target, the World Cocoa Foundation, with whom we're working to digitize the cocoa sector, uh, ethical tea partnership that we're working with to, to, to digitize tea and coffee value chains, especially here on the continent. Um, Kenya was a founding member, <laughs> my, one of my mentors, Professor Bitang and Demo, uh, was, uh, um, was key to, to, to the launch of the Better Than Cash Alliance. Um, the main thing that we do is we provide advisory services to our member states and our, uh, our, our, our Company, uh, the companies that work with us and international organizations around the value of digitization and why it really is important that payments become responsible. Anytime a customer complains, <laughs> it's all right. So. So that, uh, that's who we are, I won't, uh, I won't take up so much time. So these are our members, um, and our everyday work is to ensure that we are holding them accountable to their commitment to take economies from cash to digital, and international organizations are there. If, you know, not if, when, because I intend to be successful. When I'm successful, we should have African companies uh, 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 on these slides uh, in the near future. Um, okay, working. Um, so my role is specifically to work with, oh, there we go. <laughs> the benefits, I don't think I need to tell you, but fundamentally why we are telling, uh, okay. Okay, why what we tell governments is essentially this, and you all know this. Uh, how much time have you saved? How much money have you saved by simply uh, switching to, to digital payments? Transparency, I think we're seeing many governments do this uh, uh, in digitizing their payments. But even for us, from an individual perspective, you know what you're spending, you're holding yourself accountable as you digitize your payments. Women's economic participation, it goes without saying. For the micro and small merchants that are largely uh, uh, ignored uh, by policy, if you think about the uh, cross-border traders, whose trade is not even acknowledged in the global trade numbers, right? So when you read about intra-African trade today, they say it's 16%. That's because what's happening at our borders among almost 300 million Africans, because it is in cash, it's not counted. So with any luck, and especially with this big village that we are creating, the One Africa Market, we should be able to 
uh, give everybody the dignified financial services that they need in order to achieve their goals. So our guiding Bible is this. So for you fintech developers and service providers, we've done, we've developed the UN principles for responsible digital payments, and really these are centered around building trust and mitigating risks. And if <laughs> at uh, uh, when you're releasing your, your product, you're saying we have adhered to all or some of these, that would be excellent. But ideally, we believe that when the principles are respected and adhered to, and they, I'm sure there are other things that guide your innovation, as long as a customer is not complaining about your service, as long as every time they go to transact, uh, it works, and when it doesn't work, they know exactly what to do, who to call, therefore making recourse clear is important. So please innovate with these in mind, such that I can get out of doing this job. <laughs> so our focus specifically uh, uh, as it relates to the continent, my number one focus right now is on the Africa continental free trade area, and that is really to ensure that at the foundation of the protocols that are being developed is digital payments as, a, as, you know, as they facilitate and simplify uh, trade. So again, jo join me in this quest. Sitoya was talking about uh, uh, regulators being friends, uh, not enemies, and they're us. Fundamentally, those that are negotiating the protocols are trade lawyers. They don't know much about what it takes to drive digital payments. So we are working to ensure that they appreciate that. And we're doing so by bringing examples from the countries that are members. We have countries like Cote d'Ivoire, where we worked on a merchant uh, uh, guidance note. The government loved it. They made it their, uh, their, their, their tool of reference uh, to advance uh, merchant digitization. We are also working now, taking lessons that we got in Ghana with digitizing of the, uh, um, of the cocoa sector to digitize the, the cocoa sector in Cote d'Ivoire. Even Indonesia is taking the lessons that we got from Ghana to digitize uh, the, the value chain. Ethiopia joined in 2016. <laughs> Safaricom can attest to how long it's taken for them to, uh, to, to get into the market. But that's because really the importance of engaging government leaders, policy makers, uh, central bank governors to get them to appreciate why competition is necessary, interoperability is necessary. That's the work that we're doing. Uh, so all these lessons uh, from Ghana where we, in a study that we did, we found that $25 million is lost in cash annually because of uh, 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 theft. Uh, unfortunately, there are also loss of lives because of the huge management of cash. So with the, uh, with the National Cocoa Board committing to this, they're really driving to ensure that the entire value chain from crop to the finished product uh, is digitized. And with these lessons, we are showing the those that are negotiating our 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 one africa market protocols supporting the secretary general of the cfta to appreciate the importance of getting digital payments right ensuring that the that there's a protocol on digital trade there's a, um digital financial inclusion is driving everything and women are at the center of uh, of all this is essentially what we're doing and so we we, we, in collaboration with the African Continental Free Trade Area Secretariat, the African Union, the Smart Africa Alliance, we've done a call to action for digital financial inclusion, specifically focused on where my heart is, merchant payments. Today, P2P is working beautifully, but the most important thing that we do every day, which is pay for goods and services, remains a big challenge to, 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 uh, to make it work. So if we can get payments to, to businesses and businesses to also pay each other in this decade that we have made the African decade for, sorry, the decade for the African uh, women's financial and economic inclusion, we will succeed. And this is why I really need you all to join us in adopting these principles in everything that you're doing. When you're not being served the way you should, please 
refer to any of these, but as innovators, uh, I think it's important that uh, we put this at the heart of what we're doing. Uh, Sitero talked about don't just develop, really think about the deeply felt needs of people and what you're solving because it really does sell. And that is why we've seen the boom with, uh, uh, with fintechs. I am working specifically to ensure that governments appreciate the work that you're doing. They are enabling the policy environment to, to, to make it easier for you uh, put sandboxes that you can test your innovations with, have interoperability that drives uh, our regional collaborations so that we can become this market of 1.3 billion people that is really your customer to innovate for. So as you sit in your, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in your, on your computer, tell us, we will advocate with, uh, with our government partners and members as well as the regional bodies to ensure that they're doing right by you but also you doing everything possible to protect the monies that people trust us with. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you so much. I'd like you to remain on stage as I call my other panelists to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. So as the panelists come on stage, I'd like to check in the room. Um, how many of you here are in the FinTech uh, community ecosystem? Any hands? So this session is, is, is just for you. Because you've heard here on the stages uh, from the, from the uh, distinguished panelists here, you know, needless to say, you've seen the graphs, the FinTech uh, space is growing exponentially. All right, you've, you've seen the testament of Vodacom, how they've grown their services in just seven years to a 1.9 billion rand of revenue per year. So the question is, why is the fintech ecosystem uh, challenged in terms of growing? Sitoyo mentioned how, uh, for example, in Kenya, the biggest um, takers of, this, uh, of the services are government. Now, surprise, surprise, right? How can government be more agile than you guys? So, Nshuti, thank you so much. This first question is for you. Fintech startups and fintech community are facing key challenges, I believe, right? In the road to their sustainability, all right? In reaching scale, in being able to navigate uh, perhaps maybe uncertainty with the regulatory environment and being able to understand how they can partner, how they can manage scarcity, and how they can build robust uh, corporate sort of governance foundations even built on these responsible uh, principles. It is said that it is four times harder to achieve profitability in Africa than it is in Latin America and 13 times harder than it is in the European Union. So tell us, how can we help our ecosystem achieve scale? Um, I, I, that, that is at the heart of why we did this call to action for digital financial inclusion. And we have five staging posts for that, and the number one thing is government leadership. Uh, we have, uh, uh, you know, our parents, our grand grandparents in some cases, leading government. They've been writing checks. They've only transacted with cash in many ways. If they need to do anything, they have someone to support them to run those errands. So they don't get to feel the pain of the ordinary trader because they're not even going to the market for the most part. So in bringing the voices of uh, 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 those women and youth uh, the disabled uh, uh, Africans that, are, that we are not even innovating for to the fore, letting government understand the opportunity, right? I, I, I'm sure they know the issues. Everybody talks about issues in almost every forum. To see the opportunity in ensuring that everyone is well served. Uh, and in getting there, innovation must thrive. Obviously, we've had traditional providers for a long time. But there's a reason why, for instance, here in Rwanda, mobile penetration is over 80% and banking is at 34%. 
And that's in the last 10 years. When I came uh, back to Rwanda, there was no place to pay. There was uh, no place for my visa. It, my visa card meant nothing. And to see that between 2012 and 2022, Sitoyo can pay for the taxi with his products in Kenya, here in Rwanda, is a testament to government saying, figure this thing out. Let us do what needs to happen. Uh, uh, I joined Visa after government, and and we worked on PSP guidelines that ensured that uh, it was easy to get a wallet and transact. So when government is aware, things change. Um, yeah, so that's the first part, government appreciating the opportunity for scale. Uh, for the second part of innovation, and I speak because I was in, in, in that seat before, is who are you solving for, right? Many times I would go to K-Lab where I would uh, meet some entrepreneurs and they're designing a product, they don't know who their customer is, they don't know how they're going to make money, you know, all these things around scale uh, was secondary to, it's a cool thing. <laughs> well, you don't eat from cool, you have to think about the customer base. And now with this opportunity of 1.3 billion market, where if we do, if we have shared standards when it comes to payment regulations, uh, 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 open standards that allow uh, uh, for APIs, you know, just like we saw the, the, the super app aspirations, I think we will be able to, 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 to tap into this youth dividend that we have on innovation. So one is being creative and thinking big and creating for that bigness, appreciating especially uh, and building from a standpoint of deeply felt needs. And we will do the work and we continue to do the work to ensure that government understands the opportunity, does uh, uh, put in place regulations that help that opportunity to thrive. Thank you for that. Um, and I, I hope audience, you're, you're, you're picking up on some of the questions you'd like to add and pose to the, uh, the panelists as we just go along. Um, Mariam, you mentioned you, ha you have an ambition that digital, that financial services are a right for every citizen. Now, many point to the transatlantic uh, cable as the first true instance of the transformative fintech when we could do electronic funds transfers. How can you make this vision come to fruition? Understanding that we have challenges in the region, as you mentioned, whereby you know, we don't even have the devices to, to leverage the super app. We don't have even some of the support that we need in terms of internet costs, how can we get those to go down? And more importantly, we also understand from what we've discussed today that 60% of the African population is below the age of 25. How do we leverage this opportunity to be able to ensure that we can bridge those challenges that we, show, we saw in your video today? Sure, Angela, I think a uh, great question. Thank you for that. Um, so, you know, I think what's important is to first understand what does success of um, financial and digital inclusion really look like for us on the African continent? And I think once you've seen what that North Star looks like um, and you know where we want to get to, it's then easier to take steps back from there and say, okay, so what are the inhibitors that are preventing us from getting there? And what do we do to ensure that we're solving for those challenges to ensure that we're able to get there? And I often say that um, having the privilege to operate on the African continent um, is, is phenomenal because often it's just jumping on an aeroplane and going into a new market and the future is there. What do I mean by that? If any of you have visited China or some of the Asian countries, that is real financial inclusion. Um, in China, for example, I was completely astounded when I couldn't pay using cash or my visa debit or credit card at any store because it's all just Alipay or WeChat Pay. And that's ultimately where we want to get to. That for me right now is the North Star of what real financial and digital inclusion looks like. So if we take 10 steps back and we talk about super apps and what are the enablers to super apps, to your point, um, the enablers are the customer needs a smartphone. So the affordability of smartphones becomes quite important. And how do we ensure that we're constantly working with the OEMs or with the big partners like your Metas, your Googles, etc., who have the same 
joint interest to get a smartphone into the hand of a customer to cross subsidize that so that it starts to make it cheaper for customers to afford smartphones, but also constantly pushing the OEMs to invest in the development of low cost smartphones. And as we see now, smartphones are becoming cheaper and cheaper as, um, as time goes by. So I'd say that's the first inhibitor is getting a smartphone into the hand um, of, of every person that we're wanting to include in this ecosystem. The second one is around coverage because um, you know, having a smartphone means nothing if someone's sitting in an area or rural area where there's no coverage. And this is where I really believe that um, telcos have uh, given up a little bit of the arrogance that they had in the past where previously telcos wanted to own every bit of the ecosystem. And now I see telcos becoming a lot more open to partnerships. Certainly us from a Vodacom group point of view um, have become a lot more open to partnering. So whether it is with um, a meta on partnering on undersea cables that they're building themselves or whether it's partnering with Google or whether it's partnering with the likes of AST which are now beaming coverage from satellites in the sky down to rural areas. Um, those partnerships have now become a lot more prevalent so that we're ensuring that everyone is able to connect from where they, wherever they are. Every corner of the African continent has some sort of coverage, um, coverage hitting it. And then I think um, the last point is around just ensuring that um, you know the cost of data again is something that is still quite high on the African continent. And how do we ensure that we're bringing that down constantly? And again, um, telcos are able to bring down the cost of data when we're able to work with regulators around the cost of spectrum. Uh, which again is quite expensive in different markets. So how do we ensure that regulators are understanding the importance of uh, why spectrum needs to be given to telcos at, at, um, at, at lower rates than they're currently demanding? But secondly, you know, once we do these partnerships with the likes of these big players, it's also able to bring down the operating costs for us as a telco, which means we can reinvest those profits into price and bring down the cost of data. So yeah, those for me are the three big challenges that we need to address and some, um, some ways in which we as the Vodacom group are trying to address those. Uh, thank you for that. And um, I think just moving on from that and looking at another opportunity uh, that presents, uh, that Sitoy mentioned in his slides was that um, the opportunity of government being at the forefront of digitalization of their services towards helping our, you know, challenged uh, citizens who don't have access to these uh, three things that you mentioned. Um, you know, I'd like to think about it from this perspective. If we're able to get government services to come on board, and this is something that you've done which we need to replicate across the continent because that's very difficult. It is said, according to Visa, that it is 17% more expensive, um, uh, no, uh, uh, digital payments uh, through businesses, you know, our SMEs and MSMEs generate 17% more in terms of revenue and have 28% more savings on costs. Can you imagine that for our continent? So we're already seeing with our youth that 59% of millennials will switch or have already switched to digital banking. They're not doing the brick and mortar. How, Sitoyo, can we replicate the success you've seen in Kenya with the penetration of these financial services to the rest of Africa in your vision? Thank, thanks, Angela. And I think uh, MPES Africa was formed uh, about two years ago, two and a half years ago, and uh, the intention with between Safaricom and Vodacom Group uh, was to, you know, become uh, the largest uh, digital ecosystem in, in in the African continent. And while MPES has been very successful in our markets, whereas Tanzania, Mozambique, DRC, Lesotho, Ghana, and the support we've been giving uh, to Egypt and soon to be Ethiopia, uh, we've been successful individually. And the reason for MPES Africa is to bring the synergies together. And uh, Mariam has talked about big tech before. Uh, PayPal, for example, we only talked to Safaricom, but not to Lesotho, the one million people, as an example. But now, when we sit on the table as, 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 as MPES Africa, we, we are able to negotiate better deals. We're able to negotiate better with, the te with our tech partners. 
uh, and so on, but also the synergies around ML, cybersecurity, it's all being done once now. So we have one operation center uh, for, for these kind of services. Uh, we're able to leverage on our talent across the group, uh, including to, 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 the, to how we, we work with, uh, with Vodapay as an example. But more importantly, I think from, from our side is also now opening up the platform. I spoke about consumers and businesses, but for, I think one of the, the you know, uh, successes and uh, it's early successes, but uh, we see it for the future is on our open API platforms that we provide to the developer community, for example, in the room. Today, we have 54,000 developers on our open API platforms. That means 54,000 people are trying to build products and services on the rails of M-Pesa. The intention is to go to 300,000 developers uh, in it. And these developers are the ones who create employment, uh, will, 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 will ensure that you know, there's no duplication as such of, 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 of platforms. Uh, we are opening up, uh, for, for example, we, we're changing our architecture from uh, to become you know, cloud native and, and microservices, which means today, if you want a lending platform, and uh, let's say, uh, and we're in an uncompete market, you could pick our lending platform, you could pick our insurance platform on Mariana, you could pick, you could pick our ML. So why should the fintech community worry about ML and cybersecurity? We should be opening our platforms and our capabilities for that as a service. So you'll be seeing a lot more of that happening. And that means that the cost of operating uh, across our footprint becomes uh, much, much, much easier. And I think, I think, and we've seen governments, uh, uh, you know, really change how they see uh, uh, mobile money. Uh, today, you know, from youth youth funds to cash transfers instead of uh, food, uh, World Food Program uh, delivering food, uh, we are seeing now, I think, the new government in Kenya talking about funds for SMEs and, and micro SMEs. So we're, we're seeing governments, there's a big shift in government and there's a big shift in, in regulators in enabling uh, digital payments. So I think it's how we take these learnings and also roll them out across the continent and, and become proud brand ambassadors of what, financial, what mobile money and financial services can actually do for the continent. Thank you. And audience, do you have any questions for our panelists? Do you agree? <laughs> any questions? None? One from the gentleman. Hi, everyone. I'm Lies from Tunisia. Thank you so much for the insights and the quality of the presentation. I had actually, um, uh, I mean, one remark and uh, one question. Uh, I, I really liked, uh, Mr. Stoy, how you presented. Um, you said, I think even you said like before, not talk about fintech only, but talk about a whole ecosystem. And I want to ask at what time uh, did this like vision or like willingness to build it as an ecosystem came in the strategy or the vision of M-Pesa? Was it like from the beginning of the case? The other case question is to uh, Ms. Mariam, where you said um, China is for you the North Pole of financial inclusion. Uh, I don't know if I understood well, but like you said, y you were amazed how you couldn't pay by, uh, by cash or uh, by uh, using your visa card. And uh, you don't see in this statement, um, it's a harsh competition for banks that are already scared from fintech. So, is this where we are going? Or like, what would be the future? What would be the place uh, for banks in this future? Thank you, somebody. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Luis. Um, I think we've always played a bit on the ecosystem. Um, from when we started, we've partnered with banks, so the whole, uh, you know, the funds within the M-Pesa ecosystem are actually held by, by, by banks uh, in it, and the bigger m has grown, actually, the more uh, the, 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 the banks have come in. But at the beginning, there was a lot about innovating to solve the problems that we're having, and a lot about that was our teams innovating, and M-Pesa at that time, and the technologies at that time, 
uh, there was no APIs, there was no cloud, it was hardware-based systems. It was very difficult to open the system, even if you wanted to. Uh, but the, you know, the la in the last probably four or five years, technology has really changed. You know, if you say ten years ago was there cloud, no, wasn't there. You know, uh, so I think the advent of technology has also enabled us to open up the the ecosystem. But I think it's it it comes from a willingness as a business to say there's more innovation outside and better than there is in, within my team. So how do you enable this developer community, the fintech community, the reg tech, and all that other you know, players to come in and this ecosystem. So uh, in 2012, there were 5 million bank accounts in Kenya. Today, over 40 million bank accounts, bank accounts have been opened through the Mpesa ecosystem. And, and that has, you know, uh, enabled the banks, flourish. the banks are doing really well with regards to, you know, they don't have to have an agent network uh, as such. Today, we are the largest uh, uh, mobilizer of cash cash into the banking, uh, banking ecosystem. We push more than... Um, uh, $3 billion on a monthly basis into the banking ecosystem. So uh, to, to, to this part of the ecosystem is playing this marketplace that Mariam talked about. We are just a platform now that for people to come in. The channels, uh, however, will be the super app, and then we leverage on the big data for the personalization uh, of, of it. But I think ensuring that the system is scalable, secure, uh, is, 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 is really important for us so that the players in the ecosystem don't have to worry about that. They can work. They can worry on doing what's best for, for, for their customers. Thank you. OK, yeah, just to add, uh, thanks for that question. I think the um, analysis or the comparison to China is really just around um, how financially and digitally included everyone is in that country with the fact that there's coverage everywhere. Everyone has a smartphone um, and through the smartphone people are able to transact both financially and digitally and how do we get our continent to that point? Um, we know that once you put a smartphone into the hand of someone it doesn't only do wonders from a financial services point of view but I think just from a lifestyle point of view people are able to um, learn through the internet, they're able to get access to jobs through the internet, they're able to upload a profile so that someone looking for a skill that they have is able to find them. So um, that comparison draws more to the element of financial and digital inclusion and once you've got people included into the ecosystem you're able to offer them so much more which could be a blend between financial services and non-financial services but in a digital interface. Um, in terms of your question around you know where do banks feature in this I think there will always be a space for banks especially because many fintechs these days just prefer to play over the top and we have the standing joke in in the telco where um, we believe in the same way that the likes of whatsapp and google and meta have played over the top on the telco pipe at the bottom <laughs> now it's the telco's turn um, our own little sweet revenge as an example with the banks because we don't want to be regulated we don't want to be a bank certainly in in the in the voter pay context um, we just want to play over the top we want the banks to still be left with the heavy compliance the heavy regulation etc and we just want to play over the top so um, yeah there'll always be a space for banks we want to leave all of that with with banks and and um, we just want to monetize around understanding the customer, personalization of our propositions, making everything simple through a digital interface, et cetera.